Hello everyone. I know it has been a while here, but I am back. I apologize for the delay. I know I haven't been uploading, uh, uploading any videos in a while, but hey, here we are. So today I wanted to go ahead and talk about the Zulus, because one of the big battle discussions that we had had is what would happen if Vikings faced off against Zulus. Now, I've already covered Vikings in the past. I gave them a whole intro. I explained how their society worked, uh, how their warriors uh, would go into battle, how their army organization was structured, everything like that. So I figured that what I would do today is I would give a bit of an intro about the Zulus. Now, when one is talking about the Zulus, there are several time periods that they could be talking about. The most common time that we think about when associating the Zulus is either with the rise of the Zulus under Shaka, or the destruction and subjugation of the Zulus by the British in the Anglo-Zulu War uh, in 1879. For the purpose of a fight between the Zulus and the Vikings, you're going to want to look at the Zulus at effectively their peak. Uh, and when I say peak, I don't mean at the greatest extent of their power. I mean when they were probably the most refined, under the greatest leadership. And in that case, that would be under Shaka. So we're going to approach this with the idea that Shaka is effectively leading his men. So the Zulus as a people were not warlike. I know, that sounds weird. But that is actually the case when you look back at them before the rise of Shaka. In fact, the Zulus were actually a very small tribe. They were not a dominant one. They weren't even the greatest power in their general area. And they, like many of the tribes around them, primarily focused on cattle herding, farming, and a bit of trading. But wealth was concentrated in cattle. How many cattle you had basically determined your status in society. Uh, and what ended up happening is that the rise of Shaka changed the Zulu structure. Because military in this area were largely, the term would not necessarily be ceremonial, but it was something to where warfare was ritualized. So here's how it would work. Prior to the rise of Shaka, the way that warriors fought is that war bands would gather together and they would go to war with another tribe. When you went to war with that tribe, you fought as individuals, not necessarily in formation. You would go into battle with an oxhide shield and several throwing spears and you would go into battle, you would throw your spears at the enemy to try and drive them off, and then you would retreat. And you would see this pattern time and time again in warfare. And because they're throwing these javelins, which are called asagai, that is something that it generally did not kill people. Obviously, you would get killed if you got hit in the chest with a javelin. Like, that, there's no question of that. But with a large oxhide shield, merely throwing a couple javelins and then retreating, typically this means the casualties were very low. And so whoever took the most casualties, who was driven off, was the loser in this case. And what would happen is that the successful army would go on to raid and pillage the tribe that they had defeated. People may be killed, but it was more so property was taken, especially cattle. Again, cattle was how you determined your wealth, and that means that the more cattle that you stole, the more wealthy and powerful that you got. Shaka changed the structure, though. When Shaka rose to power, he took ideas that other tribes had, and some that he perhaps had himself, and he created his own Zulu force in his image. So what he did was he changed the focus of warfare from the throwing spear to a new spear. Now, we still call it the Asagai, but the proper name for this here is called the Iklwa. Now, what the Iklwa was, was a short stabbing spear, something whose pole was only about two feet in length, but the blade at the end of it was much longer than a standard throwing spear. It was something that was like having a little sword blade on the end of your spear. 
and this was a short stabbing spear that was designed for you to get up close with the enemy and brutalize them. What he did is he introduced a style of warfare where instead of standing at a range and skirmishing with your opponents, you would close in rapidly, force them into hand-to-hand -hand combat, and slaughter as many as you could. And to do so, he introduced a style of warfare known as the Bullhorns, or just the Bull. The Bull formation was composed of three categories. You had the chest, the horns, and the loins. Now the chest, which was the first to enter in the battle, was composed of more experienced members. Not necessarily the most experienced, but they were older, stronger men who would be counted on to hold the line. They would rush into battle with their cowhide shields equipped, and they would close with the enemy as quickly as they could. As they were charging in, they would throw their throwing spears, this could be one, two, three, etc., however many they're carrying, and then they would charge to close. As they would close, they would ram into the enemy with their shields, then they would take their shields in a way where they would try and hook their shield around the shield of their opponent and yank it away. And in doing so, it would expose the opponent's ribs where the short stabbing spear could then get in. What they would do here is they were designed not to necessarily defeat the enemy, but to hold them in place. The second part of this formation was known as the horns. The horns were composed of younger, more inexperienced men, but their age being younger meant that they were oftentimes a bit more physically fit in terms of endurance. They could run for longer periods. They were faster. So the horns, their goal was to flank and encircle the enemy, much like the horns of a bull, and pincer the opponent from their sides and rear. This is often what would take men by surprise, because they didn't really have cavalry there in South Africa. That wasn't something that was utilized. So these men would move around quickly, pincer the opponents, and at this point they may just break. If the enemy did not break when this occurred and the melee was engaged, then the enemy might start looking for a chance to break out of this encirclement. After all, the Zulu forces have split up their army into three different parts. That third part was known as the loins. The loins were the oldest, strongest, most veteran elite troops that the Zulus had under them. And their goal was to stand behind the main army, and if it looked like the opponents were about to break out of the encirclement, or if it became too light in one of the areas, they would be deployed in a decisive blow to turn the tide of battle. This idea of keeping reserves, of not committing all of your forces to the battle at once, and of closing with the enemy, made for extremely brutal warfare. Now, in terms of equipment, I've already talked about the Zulu spear, the Ikwa, and the Asagai, the long throwing spear. The Zulus did not really have armor. They had a shield, which was a large, very strong, a fairly heavy cowhide shield. And this was something that was used heavily for warfare, not just on a defensive matter, but offensive, as I said. But what's interesting is that unlike many other societies who fought in such archaic ways, you could argue, particularly this being the 1800s, they had a very interesting innovation. So under Shaka, the military equipment, particularly the shield, was actually provided by the state. So if you take, for example, Vikings, if you looked at medieval warriors, if you looked at any other kind of society, there are very few that provided the weapons and armor to their soldiers. The Romans did it. Some places in, say, for example, Japan did it during the Sengoku Kujidai with providing spears, but the majority of weapons and armor were something that an individual had to get for themselves. This often meant that for the youngest members of society, they were equipped with little more than javelins, maybe not even a shield. So they would go in, skirmish, and then retreat. But Shaka changed all that by providing a spear, by providing a shield, by providing these things that were the core of the army, he ensured that there would be a standard level of equipment across all categories. Now, some warriors were still equipped with clubs 
with axes, with other types of weapons. But these were the standard equipment that each and every warrior would have. Every warrior would be able to have throwing spear, every warrior would have a shield, and every warrior was going to have a very deadly stabbing spear. The third and final thing that I want to touch on is morale. For an ancient army, or on that note, any kind of army, you can be as powerful, as heavily armored, as deadly as you want, but it does not matter if your soldiers run away from the fight. Shaka had a rather interesting method of dealing with this. So, the Zulus did not retreat. Or rather, they couldn't retreat if they wanted to live. Or for their families to live. So what the Zulus did is they implemented an extremely brutal strategy. If a soldier, if a group of warriors retreated from battle, if they lost a battle and they left, when they returned they would find that their families would have been beaten to death on the orders of Shaka. And they would witness this before they themselves would be killed. What this did is it instilled a level of fervor, of fear, of blind, absolute devotion. You did not retreat as a Zulu. It did not matter if you were the last person left. You continued to fight. In this sense, a Zulu army could be defeated. But if they were defeated, then generally speaking, they were annihilated. They would fight to the last man. Because it did not matter. They were dead men anyway. But on that note, there is actually something more positive that I would like to say. Uh, even if each and every man would be killed, and you might wonder, okay, well, if they lost any battles, how the hell would they maintain a population doing so? And it's a very interesting thing. The Zulus did not conquer a territory and treat its people like slaves. That's not how that worked. Under Shaka, if the Zulus conquered a territory, the tribe of that place, after being defeated, would be fully incorporated into the Zulus and given full rights. For all that anyone cared, that tribe, whatever its name was before, is no longer that tribe. They are Zulus. And in doing so, every time they would conquer a small little tribe around them, their warriors would get brought into the military. And that actually leads back to the previous point, how would they ensure that those warriors would be loyal? Well, they're Zulu. And if they retreated, then their families, who are under the protection of Shaka, they are also subject to his will and punishment. As a result, this meant that each and every tribe that would be brought into the Zulu's fold would be trained, would be equipped, and would be sent to battle all in the same manner. There were no differences with the exception of rank and experience. And on that note, I'm going to go ahead and leave you here. This next video, we're going to talk about what would happen between a Viking force and a Zulu force and what that would more than likely look like. Please give me a like and a comment below. Let me know what it is that you think. I'm trying out a, little, uh, a new little thing here in the video, as you can probably see by now, even though I'm recording this before I actually edit it. Uh, but the pictures, etc., things that I'm putting in, I want to give you an idea of what it is that I'm describing. So please let me know what it is that you think. I hope that this method works better for everyone. You have a good rest of your day.